you know, with us this evening is uh, is one of the country's most knowledgeable and experienced experts on defense policy, former Secretary of Defense Ash Carter. Now, U.S. defense secretaries have come, of course, from a variety of backgrounds, military, business, political, uh, academic. By inclination and training, uh, Ash is a scientist. He has a doctorate in theoretical physics from Oxford. But he got involved in, in his 20s in an MX missile basing study that triggered a fascination with the problems of international security, which have remained a focus of his ever since. He first served in the Pentagon in 1981 as a science advisor, then spent time at MIT and a longer stint at Harvard before returning to the, to the Pentagon under President Clinton as an as assistant secretary for several years. He was back again at the start of the Obama administration, becoming the president's acquisition chief, the department's number three position then moved up to Deputy Defense Secretary so, so that by the time he assumed the Secretary's role in 2015, he was better prepared for it than a number of his predecessors had been. So he knows the Pentagon well, and he draws heavily on his own experiences in his new book, Inside the Five-Sided Box. But the book is meant to be less a me memoir uh, than a sort of guide to the Pentagon, an effort to, to demystify the place, uh, elaborate on some key defense policy decisions of recent years, uh, and convey some, some lessons of leadership. Uh, it's worth recalling that in his own time as defense secretary, uh, Ash, among other accomplishments, led the military effort to destroy the Islamic State, manage the strategic pivot to the Asia Pacific, and launched a, a national cyber strategy. He also fostered a more agile approach to the relationship between the Pentagon and the tech sector and opened all military positions to women without exception. As Ash notes at the start of his book, the Pentagon in its sheer vastness dwarfs most institutions on earth. Uh, if you don't count entitlements and interest on the national debt, the Pentagon manages uh, more than half the federal budget uh, and it employs more people than Amazon, McDonald's, FedEx, Target, and uh, General Electric combined. Um, Ash's book provides an illuminating and insightful look at how the Pentagon really works. And it's written very clearly uh, and accessibly. With Father's Day coming up this weekend, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, right? I'd be remiss if I didn't stress that the book would make a great gift especially for those dads out there who've always wanted to be Secretary of Defense <laughs> or who always thought they should have been. I figure that last line would resonate particularly well here in D.C. Anyway, Ash will be in conversation with, uh, with David Ignatius, uh, who uh, uh, is um, among, uh, among Washington journalists, is as informed about national security policy as they come. David's uh, regular columns in the Washington Post are among my favorite, largely because they're filled not only with smart opinions, but often with uh, actual news about national security affairs, economics, and, and politics. Plus, he's a terrific writer of spy thrillers, the latest of which is The, Qu the Quantum Spy. Uh, he's done t 10 books so far, which in addition to being, to being very entertaining, are rooted in the same expert reporting that has distinguished David's journalism for decades. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ash Carter and David Ignatius. So Mr. Secretary, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I you, already sure. know what my Father's Day gift is for my dad. <laughs> Um, who is 98 and is a veteran of, of Pentagon uh, Wars and is going to love your book. I have my own copy here. You can see all the yellow post-it notes, which shows that I'm ready for the extra credit question from, uh, from Secretary Carr. So I want to um, begin where uh, Brad Graham uh, started in his introduction of you. You have been involved in national security matters uh, from this unusual perspective of a brilliant scientist, a theoretical physicist, starting in 1980, continuing until you left as Secretary of Defense, 
uh, in the beginning of 2017. And I want to ask you whether we are now at an inflection point in terms of the technology of war, whether there are new weapons coming, autonomous systems, AI-driven weapons, uh, even uh, laser and, and particle weapons that are going to change warfare. And then I'm going to ask you also to, to tell us, are we going to be safer in that world? Um, uh, yes, we have reached an inflection point, and it's in the sense you describe and in, and in one other. Uh, but simply in terms of the the pace of technology and the nature of technological change, I think you get a sense of it by think from thinking about how technology is affecting the rest of life. We all have the experience of the effects of social media on the nature of human interactions, on the nature of politics and the press, all very consequential. Well, uh, you know, similarly, digital technology is affecting warfare. Artificial intelligence, same thing. What we haven't seen yet in our lives, but we're beginning to see the beginning of, and that will also affect national security, is the bio-revolution to come. We are on the cusp of something that in terms of its consequence will make the digital revolution of the last 20, 30 years seem small in comparison. That will affect us too uh, in, in defense. And so, yes, we are, I, but I think people can get a sense of its magnitude, if not all the particular, you don't have to know about any submarine warfare, uh, to get a sense from your day to day life and all the things that we see around us of the magnitude of the change for us in defense, it's going to mean saying goodbye to things that we are used to either con concepts or systems. No question about it. I wrote about the joint strike fighter which I worked hard to make sure became a reality in this generation. And I said, I don't expect, I, it'll probably be a last tactical fighter aircraft, main tactical fighter aircraft we ever build. Um, and so you'll see a lot of the big iconic things go away, but the changes will be deeper, uh, deeper than that. Um, the other thing that's going on though, that is, I notice a lot because I've been doing this a long time and because I started as a scientist, as you noted, is that the relationship between the Defense Department and the scientific community is not the same. I worked very hard to try to bring them closer after a generation of, uh, at best, sort of ignoring one another and at worst, real estrangement. Um, because I don't think we can continue to be the best simply by growing our own technology with our own budget within our own walls. Uh, we have to connect to the tech sector. And in, the, in my day, when I started, that was a reflex of everyone who was a scientist. And that's how I got into things in the first place. Those days are long gone, the sort of Manhattan Project mentality, long gone. So both in style and in... Um, uh, in substance, and until we can be safer, I'll just give you one word. You know, uh, uh, that's up to us. So uh, uh, let me put it this way. I think we can be safer, certainly as safe, and we darn well better be. And that's why I'm so determined to, that we stay in this game and win this game. I'm, I'm reassured, sort of. Um, but I'm going to take, <laughs> take your word for it. Let, let me just ask you to focus a little bit more on the point you made about the technology community. Uh, it is, uh, to me, uh, worrying that the brightest minds in, in America's top uh, tech companies, the sorts of people who, like you, just automatically, instinctively wanted to work for, for and with their country, now seem to want to keep their distance. The way in which Google, yeah. under pressure from its software engineers, pulled back from what, what's called Project Maven yeah. is the best example. So my question for you is, how is that breach going to be resolved? Because it seems to be getting, uh, if anything, worse. A couple of things. One is I notice from what I do now, which is teach students, that are wonderful. They're like soldiers. They, 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 you, they, they're where you wake up for every morning, these great young people. And they're different. Uh, Dave, this generation is different from 10 
or 20 years ago. And I don't know exactly what it is, um, but part of it is they look around themselves and they know that something's wrong. And so they don't, they don't accept the fable that technology by itself automatically leads to better things. They see too much around them that tells them that's not true and that we need to bend the arc of technological change in the direction of human good, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, um, and not just assume that it's going to go uh, that way. And that gives me hope. Uh, secondly, uh, I think you, I, I have an argument, and I just published this actually in a little article, that I, I, I would have recommended, and I actually offered to Google to come do a town hall uh, at the time they were making it, because I think they were pushed around by a, very, a relatively small group of employees. And you can't allow that. You're a leader of a major institution. If you can't stand up to your own people, provided you think they're wrong, which the senior leadership has subsequently made clear they did think was wrong. I mean, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you there for? But at any rate, were I to talk to them, I would have said, first of all, I'm glad you're thinking morally about what you're doing. That's appropriate, and I associate myself with you. We thought morally about what we're doing in the Department of Defense. I don't make any apologies about that. It's the right thing to do. And you should do that about everything that Google does. But... Second, how are you, this is your government. It, how are we supposed to get it right? If you're concerned that we're going to screw this up or do something terrible with technology, you're the experts. How are we supposed to get it right with, if you won't play? And, you know, my attitude was when I was a junior scientist, I could see that everything wasn't done from my point of view right. But my instinct was I was going to get in the game and make it right, not I was going to stand apart from it. And the last thing I'd say to him is, you guys work for and in China. <laughs> Do you think you know when you're working for the PLA? So I, and you, know, you got to reason with, with, with people. But it's been a while since people in the tech community have really been challenged. It's been the fun thing to do, and it's been sort of automatically good and cool. Uh, fascinating answer and a, and a keeper uh, for me. I just would note for this audience, one of the many interesting parts in the book is when Secretary Carter talks about writing a memo, uh, a study of the so-called Star Wars technology in the 1980s during President Reagan's time, and it was absolutely scathing. It essentially said, this cannot possibly work. And people at attacked Ash over and over. He held his ground. Uh, but it's an example of what you mean. If you as a technologist hadn't been there to say, this ain't going to work, uh, who knows uh, what we would have spent. And, and to, uh, yes. And I, first of all, I was too dumb to know that I was, do, I was wading into a firestorm. I thought I was just saying, I, I knew the physics, but I didn't know the politics. And I, I was asked this question. I knew about free electron lasers and excimer lasers and chemical lasers and x-ray lasers. But I didn't know that, uh, that within days of the publication of this, which was the first unclassified report based upon full access to classified information. I had just left Casper Weinberger's Office of Secretary of Defense that uh, the President of the United States would announce that it was his aspiration to base a defense system on this very same technology. And, uh, the, and, so, and then this avalanche came at me. I, said, I was thinking to see, all I did was tell the truth and I didn't understand it. It wasn't controversial in the scientific community. And so I was frightened and I thought my career was over and, and, and so forth and then I, and so, but here's, and here's the good thing, uh, Dave, about this story is people stuck up for me. And what I remember is not being attacked. I remember being stuck up for. And I always took that as a lesson. We need to stick up for younger people and we need to stick up for subordinates when they're doing the right thing and they're getting in trouble for, for doing, that's an important part of leadership, is sticking up for people who are doing the right thing. And the seniors in the field, some of them publicly, but some of them just privately would call me up and say, you'll live through this, 
it's okay. You did the right thing. You're not in disgrace. And, and I, I, I saw my way through and that, that really stuck in my mind. And now when I saw one of my subordinates getting hammered from Congress or from any other constituency, uh, around, and they were basically had done in good faith, something that was honest, even if it wasn't right, it's was honestly done. I thought it was important to stick up for uh, for that. That's something worth remembering today. We have a lot of folks in the back, and I'm going to suggest you hold your mic a little cl uh, closer so that everybody in the back can, can hear you. Um, so you mentioned China and the PLA's uh, ever-present, ever-vigilant uh, approach. And I want to read something you wrote in the book uh, about uh, China. You wrote, the de facto economic relationship with the, that we have with China is that we give up skilled jobs in the United States in exchange for cheap goods from China, which we buy with money borrowed from China. I think this has been bad for the American people. And I read that and I thought, you know, that sounds a little bit like somebody <laughs> I see often on television, <laughs> President Trump. And so let me ask you straight up, uh, is, is President Trump right that this is the time to try to challenge China on terms of trade and other things before it gets any stronger? I, mean, I, I, I meant when I said that, and I think he is one of many. I mean, what, what, David, what I would say is that you see in President Trump a, an example of a growing recognition on the part of people in the United States. And I've certainly had this recognition grow in me over the last 15 years, not over the last 15 months, but over 15 years, that what we all hoped China would become in the 80s and 90s um, is not to be. Uh, that the Chinese mindset that Things have been pretty good out here in the Asia Pacific because we have been part of the international system that was created before we emerged from Maoism. That view eclipsed by the hundred years of humiliation, uh, our destiny is to dominate Asia and expel the United, that strategic view. I, I've been dealing with the Chinese right along. I knew Jiang Zemin, I knew uh, Hu Jintao, I know Xi Jinping. Um, uh, it, that, that has been that steady evolution. And that is why I came to the conclusion some time ago when I was reflected in my own activities when I was in office that we needed to push back and we needed to defend ourselves. And we couldn't continue with that model. Another way of saying it is that this is a communist dictatorship. And I'm not out to conquer them, start a war with them, or make them not be a communist dictatorship, but you've got to understand that it creates an asymmetry in economic relations between an individual company and going up against the entire Chinese government or a small Southeast Asian country and the entire Chinese government. That's not a fair fight. And in a war without rules, which sadly we, a world without rules, which sadly we don't have because we didn't stick with TPP, which I wish we had, um, there's no way to, uh, try to even up that playing field. And I think we need to stick up for our companies. They don't expect us to be confrontational, but they expect us to um, uh, stick up for them. And our people expect them to stick up for them. And I, I think you see that going on. Now, we're groping for a playbook for doing this because you can't go back to the Cold War playbook because we never traded with the Soviet Union. And so you see in tariffs for something, or for example, kind of a metaphor more than a total playbook for how to handle this situation. We all know that's partial. And I think the international economists need to fill out the playbook um, here um, because we do need to protect ourselves without starting World War III. Just to, to focus that uh, with the question that your our mutual friend, your predecessor at the Kennedy School, Graham Allison, poses, are, are we destined for war with China? No, I, he and I have, I've argued with him about that. You know, Thucydides said that uh, Athens and Sparta were destined for war um, uh, because of the growth of a new power and the fear of an older power. 
I don't, and then so substitute China to the United States, I don't buy the second half of that. I, and, and that was really the true the, the story of the Peloponnesian War. I'll also <laughs> remind you that Sparta lost, and I remind the Chinese of that all the time, <laughs> just in case you get carried away with this little piece of historical analogy. Let's remember uh, that there was a war, and your historical side lost. So to ask about uh, one uh, facet of the competition that is emerging with, with China, uh, space warfare, the prospect of, of space warfare. It, is it fair to argue that the U.S. Air Force, which had responsibility for this domain, uh, lost a step, was slow in seeing and responding to emerging challenges to U.S. Primacy, the ability to defend these assets in space on which every part of our national defense rests? Uh, that isn't the principal deficiency I, I saw. Let me, if I can say, all y'all, many of you know this, but for those who don't, we don't have any true weapons in space to speak of, not many anyway. Most of the stuff we have in space is military support equipment, it is communications equipment reconnaissance and surveillance, um, geodetic measurement, navigation. It's military support stuff. It's vital military support stuff. So if the enemy attacks it in wartime, it's debilitating. Um, but most of the weapons that they would use to attack it are on the ground, and they go up into space either with energy beams, radio frequency or otherwise, um, or interceptors, which the Chinese and the Russians are both... Um, uh, tested. So that's how it plays out. Now, uh, to me, the key is that we integrate space into our standard war plans. That's what I've been that's what I've been arguing for for a long time. So let's take the China plan just as a I can't go into this in detail, but you, you'd have to look at every day that that campaign unfolded if God forbid it ever does. but we we and we, envision how that would go and what we would do at every turn in that kind of circumstance and say, what will we do if they do this? And what in turn will we do to their space out? It's got to be integrated into warfare. Um, every once in a while, and that's the, that's the key, and it has been too segregated is the answer to your question. Not, not, and not, if there's a sense in which it was blown, it was that persistent segregation. Now, uh, this president, and by the way, his predecessor, President Obama, were both attracted to the idea of a space force. And I don't know that you know that Obama does. I did not know that. That's oh, man, it kept, he had, I forget how many meetings. And I would have to go in and say, no, 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 <laughs> because it was a bad idea. But it's a, you can see how it's attractive. And, it's, and I would say it's not the right managerial approach. We need more integration of space with warfare. And you're going to create a new thing that will spend two years figuring out what its uniforms look like and what its <laughs> song is and where its offices are. And we know what things are like. Many of you work in the government. It's, it's, it's human nature. And, and um, that's going to be all tail and no tooth. And it's not going to, it's, it's the wrong, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I was the manager of the place for a long time. And so I think about it managerially. And I, I said, the, the, the right managerial approach is an integrative approach, not a segregative approach. And I was able to prevail with that argument on President Obama. But the same people are obviously lurking around when a new president came and they obviously persuaded him. So I, we're, we're, uh, I think headed at least in part in that, in that direction. And well, you know, we'll pick ourselves up and move on and, and do the right thing in the end, but it's, it's not the right direction. So, so some of the, uh, truly fascinating parts of this book are about the managerial side that you just referred to, um, like, the purchase of weapons, the process yeah, of procurement. Yeah. And you tell a story that's so uh, wonderful. I, I want to ask you to tell it with this audience. It's about your conversation with the CEO of Lockheed Martin in 2009. 
uh, when what's now the F-35, then known as the Joint Strike Fighter, is being procured. And if I'll just start the story, uh, you're asking him about cost, and he says to you, the CEO, you tell me how much money you have, <laughs> and I'll tell you... <laughs> I'll tell you how many planes you can buy. And take the story from there. Well, you can imagine my reaction to that. On the acquisition, I'm the customer, the cheek to talk to. The real customer and the representative of the taxpayer. Uh, they, they warned us about this. The cheek to say to the your customer, the... Uh, who, who is sitting on the warfighter and the taxpayer of the United States' side of the table. I understand it's business is business, so I'm prepared to negotiate. But to tell me that rather than naming a price, you're just going to, uh, you're not going to tell me what that is. You're going to ask how much money I have in my budget, and you're going to take it all and give me whatever planes you want. I was absolutely, and I Stormed out of the out of the meeting. Some of the people in the room, I think, may even, even remember this day. And I won't put any names uh, to it, but it was a sign of a program that was out of control. And uh, so, and so I devoted myself uh, a, a lot of my time as undersecretary to getting it back in the box, be, because not to be funny about it any longer. We couldn't do without it because it was the next fighter aircraft for three of our armed services. And so it, it, it would have been very difficult to backfill the failure of this thing. And it was beginning to go down the political toilet. You could see it was the, it's, it's a joke. Most places still, you mentioned the Joint Strike Fighter, people start like, oh, that's one of those gold watch defense programs that's completely out of control. So it, it, it not only was in terrible shape, it stood for something um, that was very detrimental to our future. You, you know, we can't come to you and ask you for money, um, $750 billion worth of money, if at the same time we're obviously wasting your money. It doesn't fly. And, and so you've got to deal with that kind of thing. So I spent a lot of time wrestling that program into um, the shape it's in now, basically, which is the costs of, unit costs have leveled off. We're producing the aircraft. We flew it over to the White House uh, today. I, one of the last things I did as Secretary of Defense was deliver them to Israel, to Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, and, it, it, and things ended up okay. But, um, and again, that wasn't typical of our relations with industry, but I put it in the book as an illustration of how you need people who will call bullshit on your behalf in, in, in the business dealings with the Defense Department. You're used to, more used to the policy dimensions, most people. Well, when it comes to the business deals also, you need people who are willing to be strong and straightforward and stand up. Most people here would say, Amen to that. Um, so, so we'll hand this back. But I just want to uh, finish that uh, anecdote as, as, as Secretary Carter does in the book. So to this, this question, you know, tell me how much money you have and I'll tell you how many planes you can buy, to, to which uh, Secretary Carter answers, how about none? And walks out, and walks out, the, out of the room, which kind of shakes up the, the, C, this, the CEO. Um, so on the... Several, several hundred million dollar fine didn't, didn't do him any good. So on the subject of, of, of uh, pungent comments in this book, I want to quote some things you say about our ally in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia. I found Saudi Arabia to be a frustrating partner to deal with. The Saudis made essentially no contribution to victory against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. The Saudis have consistently failed to prove themselves as good military partners. We no longer need to believe that the Saudis hold the key to the world economy. They simply don't. So I was tempted to say, so Mr. Secretary, how do you really feel about Saudi Arabia? <laughs> but... You know, it's in. It's been in the news today. Uh, there's a big debate about whether to fund continuing weapons uh, supplies to to the kingdom. 
let me put the question bluntly. Is it time to cut the cord on this relationship of supply and dependence? I don't think it's time to cut the cord. I, I, am, I am for resetting the relationship a little bit. So let me start with those ingredients. I said we're not dependent upon Saudi Arabia in the way we were in the 70s because the oil economy, the world has changed. They're still an important player and global markets remain global. And so a, a supply chain here, change here affects price everywhere and, and so forth. Uh, but it's not the same leverage as it once was. As far as arms sales are concerned, I'm all for them uh, because they strengthen our military partners around the world, which means less for us to have to do. And they're, they make our own weapons cheaper by making our own, by essentially cross-subsidizing our defenses. So I'm all in for defense experts, but they're not a gift to the recipients. And they're certainly not doing us any favors by buying it. So when the Saudis imply, and they, their, their, their foreign minister is very good at this, going around and saying, we're doing you a favor, we're buying all these weapons for you. That's a business deal. And if they feel they're doing so much of a favor to us, they should be trying to get a lower price <laughs> and, and not trying to get some extracurricular points uh, uh, for this. So that's a zero. And then in terms of their delivering for us, um, you know, I, I meant what I said about ISIS. I tried again and again and again as we were carrying out the counter-ISIS campaign and to get I from everybody around the world, uh, and, I, and I'd assign them tasks and say, you seem to be good. At, you know, the Italians, you're good at training police. Go into the Sunni areas and train Police, they're very good at that. Their gendarmerie is very good at that. And they did, and they did a great job. So everybody could do what they're good at. We were good at bringing the great hurricane of the U.S. military down behind uh, uh, forces, infantry that we trained and equipped uh, and enabled on the ground. Uh, and I said to them, okay, they don't have much of a ground force, the Saudis. The, the, their ground force is mostly for protecting the the, the king and the royal family and not for, for ex okay, fine. Um, so you're not going to do that. How about airstrikes? They did tiny, tiny, tiny amount of airstrikes. And I said, okay, how about get the old wallet out? That's, they're <laughs> been good at that. And go into those Sunni areas, which are after we take Mosul, which we will do, and after we take Raqqa, which we will do, there needs to be, they're going to have to be rebuilt. They've been tyrannized and, and, and uh, destroyed by ISIS. And they're your co-religionists. Uh, you have the money and that can be your contribution. And we didn't get that either. So I'm, I'm quite clear about it. And they were quite clear that I was frustrated. Now, should all this mean cutting the cord? No, I don't, I wouldn't say that. I mean, that's a, it's a relationship, you, you, you keep working on it, but you don't act as though it's, it's, it's like this favor Saudi Arabia, United States is so lucky to have them. I would, I would say, look, I need you guys to do more. So uh, I want to uh, leave time for the audience to ask uh, questions of, of Secretary Carter, and I'm going to ask you to line up at the microphones in just a minute. I have one more question I want to ask, and and that is um, just the most uh, simple one. Uh, we have uh, the acting Secretary of Defense, uh, Patrick Shanahan, who's been nominated to be SecDef. And I, I wonder what uh, two or three basic words of advice you'd offer for him uh, if he gets the job about how to do do that job effectively? Um, uh, uh, two, two things. First of all, in the directions that we have been talking about, like technolo technological change and strategic change, um, I hope he'll continue to go in the directions that I was going, that Jim Mattis was going. Uh, we have a lot of history of continuity in the department. Uh, things that make sense make sense to all of us. And um, so that's the first thing I'd urge. But I think that's easy because most of those things do make good sense. Um, 
Uh, another piece of advice that may be a little less commonly given, uh, but I, I feel is important, is as a leader, you have to bring your organization to do new things and to change. And, 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 uh, and, but that's only half the job. The other is to reinforce what they always do, already do well. And unless you have an organization that is really hopelessly screwed up, there's something good that people can feel good about. And it's important to make them feel good about and proud of what they do. We have a 240 year old institution. It, is it hidebound in some ways? Sure. But it, is it noble in its traditions? And, and, and does it do so many things so well? Yes. And therefore I say, you know, you really need to stick up for this institution. This is a, a, a kind of crazy world that undervalues things that have taken a long time to build and seems to not be bothered at destroying them in a day. And they took centuries to build or at least years to build. And we have the finest defense establishment in the world, I believe. And uh, you, you have a certain uh, a duty as the temporary custodian of that to make sure you don't ruin anything. At the same time, you drag people into the future when they need to be dragged. So there are those two things. I call them leadership and reinforcement. And I think reinforcement gets too little credit in our world. Secretary Shannon, I hope you heard all that. Um, we'll pass it along. So we're going to go from side to side. I want to ask each questioner, please, to keep them short. We've got a lot of folks, uh, and S Secretary Carter needs to leave uh, in about 25 minutes. So let's start on this side, and then we'll go to the other. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I have a tough question for you on, on Israel, resetting the relationship with Israel. We give them all these weapons, yet the poor Palestinians get nothing. Can you please mention how can we use our leverage to get Israel to make the two-state solution final? Uh, the question was uh, the analogous question to Saudi Arabia for Israel with the, the uh, at the end, the, the non-deliverable on Israel's side exactly. being the two-state two exactly. solution. Um, it's a very good question, and I don't have a good answer to that because it is, uh, the, the, there, it is essentially a foreign policy trade it, in their eyes we are by asking that question complete conflating a foreign policy agenda and what is for them a domestic policy agenda so if, if our Renet, Benjamin Netanyahu answering your question he'd say hey look in the security sphere defense minister to defense minister were square and I would agree with him and then he'd say, but you Americans also want us to do something else at home, which we don't think it's safe to do, and I'm not going to do that. And I, I, it, it's very hard to turn our international relationship with them into leverage on something they regard as existential uh, at home. So I hold out no hope of that. Uh, it's nowhere in sight politically in Israel, first of all. It's really not anywhere in sight in the, in the Palestine, among the Palestinians as well. And so it would be very hard, you, I'm not a huge expert on this, but for me to argue that the time was ripe for the United States to try to get another um, big jump forward in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, thing. So in the meantime, we do have important business to do uh, with Israel. I know this isn't helping you, um, but uh, we do have important uh, business to do with Israel. And yeah, we're bigger than them and we have a lot of sophisticated technology that they buy from us, like the F-35 and so forth, and they get good rates. Uh, but they do important, they do real stuff of consequence. I've gotten real value from our partnership with 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 Israel. They're very good at what they do. It's a real part. So I'm pretty satisfied with it as a defense to defense thing. I wish it were the prospects for the Palestinian situation were different, but I'm, I'm just realistically, it doesn't look like it's anywhere close and there's any amount. And I, I wouldn't want to sacrifice what we do with them uh, 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 for a cause that I knew the Israeli leadership could not and would not deliver politically. That's how I see it, sir. 
A bit of a far out question. I recently uh, read a. Ver I recently read a very powerfully reasoned book um, uh, by a Canadian public intellectual, uh, Merger of the Century, Why the United States and Canada Should Become One Country. And this is not a, necessarily a near prospect, but sometime in the 21st century. <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I assume one of the least frequently bought books in this store is Canada, our friendly little neighbor to the north. <laughs> so I suggest we go and buy a copy and, and, and consult. Now, in all seriousness, um, I, <laughs> that may be a good idea for us. And I think we ought to essentially treat them as a 51st state for many practical purposes. They're economically like us. Their values are, <laughs> except for apologizing more than we do. Um, uh, very similar uh, to ours. I don't understand feuding with our neighbors. Uh, you know, first of all, they live right next door, so having them be troublesome wouldn't be great. A lot of people have really miserable neighbors, and we don't have miserable neighbors. Um, and secondly, there are trading partners. And third, you know, we have a lot in common. Uh, with them culturally. Now, we were talking about China earlier. We were talking about Saudi Arabia earlier. These are countries that we try to have reasonable relations with and understand that we're all human beings and so forth. But we have nowhere close the cultural affinity to China or to um, uh, Saudi Arabia that we have to, uh, to Canada. So I always say, boy, if you can't get along with those people, it's going to be a lonely world out there. And I actually believe in our values. I believe in the values of the Enlightenment. And so I'm for it. And so the Europeans, that's similar. And when I see that in the Australians and Japan and our principal partners and ally and allies and partners in Europe, it's more than just history. Uh, there's something to the way we view how human society should be organized. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, that, that's not an ideology. It is a point of view on human life. And count me in the Enlightenment camp and not uh, any of these others. In other words, you'd be for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All for it. Go Raptors. Uh, sir. <laughs> uh, Mr. Secretary, I was intrigued by your comment that there, um, that biological weapons might even be more impactful than digital. Can you tell us about any cool secret weapon systems that are big developed now? <laughs> well, um, oh, uh, so the question was about bioweapons, and could I talk about any cool secret weapons? Yeah. And obviously I'm not able to do that, but you can imagine, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to go from CRISPR um, and to engineered microbes, uh, engineered cells, which we do through CRISPR techniques or other techniques today, to the engineered pathogen. And imagine the engineered pathogen now. And it's a very easy model, not the only model, is to take the spreadability of flu, but with the lethality of a more... Uh, deadly disease. The flu spreads but doesn't kill a large fraction of the population. It kills a substantial fraction but doesn't kill a lot. But you put together lethality and flu-like spreadability. Nature has not dealt us that hand. Hmm. Um, we will be able to create that. I mean, would, uh, for start, I, probably none of us would be here if na nature had ever dealt us that hand. But for some reasons, I don't think anybody understands that combination uh, has not been inflicted upon humankind, but we will create it ourselves. So there's an example you want to worry about. Now, what are we going to do about that? Now, we're not eager to be, do that kind of thing ourselves, and I hasten to add that we are signers of the Biological Weapons Convention, and we don't, we don't design. We design di biodefenses, we do not design offensive biological weapons. The other states do. The Russians, for example, have a real appetite for that, and they have a demonstrated. I dismantled huge 
um, fermenters for anthrax in Kazakhstan at the end of the Cold War when I ran the Nunlugar program. Huge things. They're like a huge brewery, a brew, uh, 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 brewing, um, uh, uh, you know, whatever, fermenter, huge fermenters for, uh, for anthrax. And I used to talk to, I remember the Russian general who I, we knew was in charge of their biological warfare program, but it wasn't anywhere on their org chart. And I used to have conversations with him and I'd look at him and I said, and you know, I said, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying. <laughs> and he was, I was certain of it. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Carter. Um, as a Navy uh, procuring contracting officer, I was curious your current take on acquisition reform and in particular DIUX. So acquisition for reform, first of all, take on acquisition reform from a Navy acquisition executive. Uh, uh, first, you've you got a lot of really good people in the, in the Navy, and it lost less in the last 20 years. Some of the other services reduced their acquisition expertise, and the Navy didn't. And you also had Sean Stackley as your boss, who was a black belt. Um, uh, but... Um, I'm sorry. And the question about the, I got lost on how yeah. good you guys were. Just, just um, with acquisi acquisition oh, reform, reform, it's always reform. reform. It's good, the bad, sorry. the ugly, it's and a, DIUX in yeah. particular. It's a, it's a Freudian slip on my part. I can't. Acquisition reform I have an issue with because I think there's something called a good acquisition tradecraft. And, um, and the people who know what they're doing know how to do that, how to deal with a situation like a joint strike fighter. And uh, they, we know what the fundamentals are and they need, we, we need to stick up for people who are doing the right thing. That's the most important thing. Every once in a while, people get a new fad. And we had, for example, a fixed price contract fad that Dick Cheney had to put up with, which led to some preposterous outcomes that were not his fault. But it was the I've had legislation passed, well-intended legislation that has been preposterous in when I when applied, well-intended. Uh, I worked for the on you know, the implementation of the Packard Commission. Dave Packard, a Deputy Secretary of Defense, Packard of Hewlett Packard, and those were actually good reforms real reforms. They were sensible and they led somewhere. But most of these things are fads. And I don't, uh, I, I think we know what the fundamentals are. And I, more often, when we screwed something up, it was because we didn't stick with the fundamentals or we got swept away with from one of these feds. So I was very careful as acquisition executive and then as deputy and then as secretary not to subscribe to fads or go in and try to get people to do things all all differently. Um, there were some things that we needed to do that were different, like learn to acquire services better because a lot of our training was how to buy stuff and half of our money went to buying services. Lawn mowing, R&D, all kinds of services. That's different from airplane ships, satellites, tanks, uh, and so forth. And we needed to get good at that because we were spending too much money on it, not well. But that's a tradecraft development kind of thing, not fads. And um, I wish I could discourage the Congress from uh, being they, fads, but they do it all the time. Most recently, amusingly, and I said this in the, um, when I first came in as undersecretary, and I couldn't say anything about this because it was passed just as I was, my, I was getting nominated, but they decided to add some things to my office several new offices, which I didn't think were necessary. But then it became part of the law, so I dutifully added them. And then to my amusement, three years ago, they decided my former office had gotten too large. And they divided it in two. They said, so they decided the office had gotten too large <clears throat> and decided to create two offices instead of one which is like a double stumper, right? <laughs> this a few years after adding a bunch of new boxes to the office, they decide that it's gotten bloated. So they divide it into two boxes. 
I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, and it just doesn't help. It's their right to do it. They have the right to write laws that affect us and so forth. But I, I mean, I wish, and they don't even ask us. One of, one of the chapters in this book is, is something like what it's like having a board of directors with 535 members. Um, <laughs> sir. Hello. Um, first, let me just say, and I've, I'm going to try and keep myself brief. It's hard to do. But um, I believe in a strong military. But what concerns me is over our long American history, our military has been misused so often basically to take other people's property, be it Native Americans, Mexicans, Spanish, whatever, whatever. And now you say we should be giving arms to Israel and Saudi Arabia. But yet, when you look at those cultures, they're doing the same thing we did in our history. So let me ask you to, to ask a question. We got a long okay. line. So okay. question for the secretary. So my question is, how are we ever going to get away from this misuse of our military? Yeah, I, I, I don't mind the question at all. I mean, I, I, I do think there's a difference between right and wrong in international conduct. And there's a difference between right and wrong in warfare. And just because we do it or have done it or plan to do it or something doesn't make it right. You have to justify the rectitude of what we're doing. Now, I'd, I'd argue with you when, if we, about Israel, if we had more time, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. But I'm not going to argue with your basic proposition. I'm not going to say we're automatically right because of who we are. I think we're, we are, we do tend to be right because of who we are because we tend to conduct ourselves as a society in a way that we make these decisions openly, where they're, they're subject to protest and, um, and questioning and all that stuff. Um, but we can all think back in our own lives on wars that haven't worked out very well that we wished hadn't started, uh, or that we thought um, were in the course of which wrong was done. Um, and uh, so I think it's a it's a perfectly fair question. I, one way to turn that into a sort of uh, uh, a thoughtful way for a secretary of defense is to say, um, how do we make sure that we bring our values to the battlefield? Um, and I will tell you, we're really scrupulous about that. I, I mean, I can tell you that when it comes to civilian casualties, say, from drone strikes, that kind of, uh, of thing, um, uh, we take U.S. law, international law, and sort of, I'll call it almost sacred law of, of proportionality discrimination, the things that various faiths have um, subscribed to over the years as laws of human conflict, we, we take all that stuff uh, pretty seriously. So depending upon your point of view, you won't regard our history as uh, infallible. I'm sure I get that. And I, um, but I, I think you're raising a very far, fair, fair point. And I'd always like to see us be on the right side of things. And our population has to believe uh, that it is. And that's why if what I was doing the ISIS thing, for example, with the country that is fighting two wars, pledged to end two wars, and I'm starting a third. Well, that's not going to win. A, that's not winning a popularity contest. Right? And I've got to convince a president that we have to do this and a Congress that we have to do this, almost ultimately a populace that we have to do this. That was a difficult thing to do because people are tired of it. And this wasn't a matter of someone who said it was the wrong thing to do. People are tired of it. And I'm tired of it too. And I know people who are a lot more tired of it than any of us because they don't have any legs or something. They're really tired of it. Or a mother and they've got a kid who's dead. They're really tired of it. So if you think you're tired of Afghanistan or whatever, um, those people are really tired of it. And I get, I understand all that. Um, but... Um, uh, you know, we uh, we have to do what's necessary to protect ourselves, but I think we have to do it in a in a right way. I don't know if that helps you or not, but I associate myself, sorry, with your concern, and I think it's absolutely fair. 
sir. Mr. Secretary, thanks again for your time tonight and your insights. I was curious, since you mentioned uh, bio war, what your thoughts are on information warfare, which has recently come into the mainstream and is no longer the future, but is a reality. Um, well, information warfare, that is information in, as a tool of traditional warfare, has been around for a while, and you know this, I can tell. Um, and so in World War II, for example, um, jamming, chaff, and uh, uh, cryptographic success um, uh, in Bletchley Park were major information warfare components of the Allied victory. Um, as significant in the European theater as the atomic advance was in the Pacific. Um, so it's been around for a while, but uh, the way I think, and this may be the deeper way in which you're meaning the question, is it changes the character of war by broadening the gray area between what we traditionally understand as war and what we traditionally understand as peace. And the Russians are the masters of this so-called hybrid warfare or fuzzy warfare, where you go in like they did in Eastern Ukraine, and then you say you're not, and you, the news is all fake, and that the people, the little green men don't belong to you, they're volunteers, and you create this cloud of rubbish around what is basically an aggressive uh, act. That is very hard to deal with. And I, my own view of that is that we need to narrow that um, uh, band by um, our own policy and declare, people used to ask me, is a cyber attack an attack? And I'd say, well, that's the damnedest question I ever heard in my life. I didn't answer it this way, but you just said it was an attack. Of course it's an attack. And so, yes. And does that mean I'm going to strike back with cyber? No. Any more than, than when people flew built, uh, airplanes into our buildings, we flew airplanes into their buildings. That's not what we did. So I'm not promising anybody I'm going to confine things to cyber war. If you attack my people and if you harm Americans or you try to get advantage in war using cyber techniques, I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to – how you did it isn't going to matter to me what the effects are. So I think this creation of hybrid warfare and the need to restore clarity to what is really aggression and not get – all lost in this fog of how it's done and whether it's information warfare, I think is pretty important. If you're going to make sure that if we're going to keep everybody on the white side of the line, because if you don't make it clear where the line is, people are going to start straying into gray. Then they'll stay into black. Then they'll stray into black, and we'll have war. Thank you. So the the boss uh, Bradley Graham has just told me two more questions. So we'll we'll stick to that. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Secretary, at the beginning of the current term, John Lehman wrote, I think in the Post, about problems with technological development, citing, I think, carry a new carrier system that could not launch yes. the planes or did it badly. How do you see our current monitoring so that we're getting what we think we are? Um, yeah, the, 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 John Lehman is a former, long time ago, but very good, Secretary of the Navy. This is a concern he has had, and it is when we replace the steam-operated catapults on a carrier deck, which give the airplane taking off enough extra speed that it can't get from its engines in the short space of a deck, enough speed to stay airborne, so it helps fling them off. Replace that with an electromagnetic version of it. And that is called emails, and there has been a checkered history to developing that. Uh, and so, as frequently happens, as it did with the Joint Strike Fighter, when something is is checkered, some people want to say, well, the hell with it. Let's just go back to steam. I think that's John's view. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that's his view. Uh, I'm not there yet on getting rid of it entirely. At the same time, 
and but on the other same time, I'm a couple of years dated on that particular thing. Um, and uh, I, you know, we've it, they've tried to fix it in several different ways. I don't know exactly what the state of play is uh, right now. It, there's no reason why it should be hopeless. There's no theoretical reason why it can't work or anything. I don't know why it is serially screwed up. Um, if I were the acquisition executive, I would know and fix or at least try. Um, but I don't know uh, right now. But I think that's what he's getting at. But it's an example of something that at a certain point, the taxpayer is going to say, OK, you guys had your chance. <laughs> you know, we've given you 10 years and a billion dollars and you're still screwing around with this thing. We've had it. And I hope that if this is not intractable, we don't have that reaction because this is better than the steam, uh, more reliable and cheaper in the long run. So I hope we can make it work and I hope we don't look so foolish so long that we embarrass ourselves into depriving ourselves of a technological advance. Thank you. Sir. Uh, why should the United States sell arms to Saudi Arabia when they're using those arms to slaughter the people of Yemen as well as kill Khashoggi? Well, that's not, that's a very good question. Um, they didn't kill uh, Khashoggi with them, but you're asking a different question there, which is how do we associate ourselves with a government like Saudi Arabia that does a number of things that are objectionable? Uh, and I'll come back to that one. But the, 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 the first point, we don't associate ourselves with, with the Yemen project. And that has called for some Americans to suggest that we, that has caused some Americans to call for an end to arms sales entirely. I'm not yet at that point um, where I'd say, okay, we're going to cut off everything that we give you, period, over our disagreement with you over, over Yemen. I realize that there's some members of Congress that have gotten to that point, but I haven't gotten to that point yet. And I am really fed up with them in Yemen. I was, they began blowing it almost from the very beginning. And we refused to associate ourselves with it, but we also refused to terminate our relationship, including our arms sales, as a consequence of it. That's a judgment call, and, and I, I stick with that, but I, I, I understand that it is, a, it is a call, and there are Americans who feel differently about it. There's no way to cut off some weapons and not other weapons. In other words, the ones there they're using their usual stuff against the Yemenis. So it's not like they're using some particular thing that we sold them that can only attack Yemenis. And if we only we stopped that one, they couldn't attack Yemenis. It's not that uh, susceptible, to that kind of a solution. As far as the Khashoggi thing, I think that's very real. I should have mentioned that, by the way, as another thing in the balance. Uh, there you have a a leadership there that is on the one hand talking about letting women go to the movies and drive cars um, uh, and wanting to advance the country economically and on the other hand sawing up some guy we didn't sell the saw um, uh, in an embassy in another uh, uh, country. I find that I spent a lot of time with Mohammed bin Salman probably as much as any other American official. Um, and uh, so I had plenty of uh, time with him. It's very difficult for me to get past, in my own thinking about him, the fact that he is so obviously, I think it's quite clear, complicit in which was a botched job in the way it was handled, but still was a murder story. So that is, that is, it is a complicated uh, relationship. I'm not an all or nothing person in it, um, but it, you, again, you got a very fair question. And there are Americans who, over time and and even now, just say, "All right, I, I'm done with these guys. Enough is enough." Thank you very much. So that uh, is a fabulous um, preview of of a book. Really worth reading. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Carter. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you all for coming.